morning, everyone. It's a real pleasure to be here. Thank you for the kind invitation. Um, I have changed the title of my talk slightly, uh, Simulating Climate Change Effects on Diseases, and I have to uh, give a disclaimer right from the beginning. I'm not an expert in infectious diseases, but a climate scientist, and I would like to offer some uh, suggestions and ideas how we can collaborate in future in order to tackle this important issue. This, I will present work which is done in collaboration with some of my team members, uh, Professor Christian Franzke from our center, uh, Ruchi Singh, Sun Son Lee, and Karl Stein. Um, and let's see if it works. All right, just a few words about our center. I launched the IBS Center for Climate Physics in 2017. Uh, IBS stands for Institute for Basic Science. It's funded by the Ministry for Science and ICT. And uh, we are hosted by Busan National uh, University, our center, uh, with the acronym ICCP, not to be uh, mistaken with IPCC. Um, ICCP uh, is uh, currently Korea's uh, largest uh, climate research center dedicated to understanding past, present, and future climate change. And currently we have uh, 32 researchers, among them five professors, 13 PhD students, and eight support staff. And in our center, uh, everything revolves our, around our planet, Earth. Uh, so we are looking at the changes uh, in the Earth, um, atmosphere, ocean, vegetation, and life in, in general. So we have several research uh, topics uh, focusing on Earth system sensitivity, uh, past and future sensitivity, uh, rainfall changes, hydroclimate, um, oceans, biogeochemistry, uh, past and future human systems. And some of this, this also includes uh, our interest in simulating uh, vector-borne uh, diseases, and I will talk about it very briefly. Um, in our center, we use one of the fastest computers in uh, com uh, Korea, um, we, uh, the supercomputer Aleph, which uh, we bought uh, in the beginning of 2018, 2019, I'm sorry. And this is a, a supercomputer that is able to simulate climate change at extremely high precision and regional accuracy. And I will show you some preliminary results of some of these new simulations that we are conducting. We are also developing new theories, uh, applying advanced statistics, and we are also conducting field work. You can see some of my team members here working in a cave in Botswana recently. Um, we run an isotope geochemistry lab where we reconstruct past climate change using actually data from these uh, cave reconstructions. So this is us in a nutshell. Uh, I would like to give you a brief overview. First, I will talk about our modeling uh, portfolio. What kind of climate models do we have? And how can they be potentially used in order to assess uh, risk, uh, future risk of diseases? Okay, first of all, what is a climate model? And I think there is a bit of a misconception in the general public. Uh, very often people think, well, we take the past climate data and we just e extrapolate them into the future like a statistical model. That's not correct. So a climate model is not a statistical model, it's a physical model. Essentially, it's a computer code, if you like. Um, so a computer code usually of uh, one to two million lines of code. So many, many researcher, researchers develop these codes. What does the code actually do? It cracks, it solves the equations of the climate system. And these are the physical equations of the climate system. So we have to deal with radiation. We have to do with the absorption of long wave radiation, the greenhouse effect, which is a quantum mechanical effect. We have to deal with fluid dynamics. The atmosphere and the ocean are fluids. So we need to describe those properly, the energy and so on and so forth. On top of this, we have certain things that are very difficult to simulate. So for instance, clouds, trees. We don't have basic physics equations for those. So we need to parameterize them. Uh, in order to capture their main uh, features. And we need forcings. So what is the forcing? Is everything that is driving the climate system from the outside. This is, for instance, us. Our human emissions of CO2 and other greenhouse gases and aerosols are a driver to the climate system. Okay, so this is a, a climate model in a nutshell. What can we do with these Earth system models or climate models? Uh, first of all, we can uh, try to uh, simulate the climate system at a very, very high regional resolution, which is very useful when you have regional decisions uh, to make. Another possibility is to run a climate model many, many different times in order to get accurate estimates of the future probability distribution of temperature, rainfall, winds at a certain location. This is very important for planning. And uh, also we can run a climate model in order to see how the ice sheets will melt in future because this is going to affect global sea level rise and many coastal regions, many coastal cities. 
Okay, in our center, the main goal is actually to provide improved understanding. We are an institute for basic science, but we are also interested in discovering new climate phenomena, um, and in particular, we are doing realistic climate projections for the future, and I will show you some examples. In addition to that, we have recently developed a multi-year Earth system prediction model, so it can uh, realistically predict the climate of the next five years. And you may wonder, how does it work? We can't predict the weather beyond two, year, two weeks, but climate and weather are different. So weather is what's happening. Climate is essentially the statistics of the weather, and that one is predictable. And also we develop uh, societal applications in our center. So if we think about an Earth system model, what, it, what does it include? Well, it includes, and that's cut off here, the atmosphere, the ocean, sea ice, land ice, fire, permafrost, dust, phytoplankton, zooplankton, carbon cycle, and atmospheric uh, chemistry. Um, and recently, we also introduced mammals, and I will show you also a mammal model simulation, a preliminary one. So a climate model is very comprehensive. Keep in mind that we are not just simulating temperature, but I can tell you how zooplankton will change in the East Sea of Korea in the year 2150. So these are uh, simple um, <coughs> uh, viewpoints right now, and let me just go a little bit more into the details. <coughs> so we conducted um, what we call a large ensemble uh, of future climate model simulations. What is it? Okay, we take a climate model, it's called the Community Earth System Model, and this one has a, a global resolution of about one degree. So we have a grid, a mesh of about 100 kilometers, and we run this model from 850 to 2014 using the existing, the historical uh, <coughs> uh, estimates of, of our forcings, greenhouse gas concentrations, etc. And then from 2015 to 2100, we run a scenario. We, we can't predict how we will change uh, the CO2 in the future, so we uh, develop uh, scenarios that can be run into the future, and this is a middle-of-the-road scenario. It's not unlikely. I hope we can do better than this. Anyways, so we run the model 100 times, and you think this is, seems like a, a waste of time. It's not, because every time we are running it, we are slightly perturbing some parameters, so that allows us to really explore the full probability distribution of the climate system. So we can compare the rainfall distribution over India, for instance. So here you have daily rainfall. Here this is the uh, occurrence of these rainfall events. And 100 millimeter per day is already a very strong rainfall event. And what you can see is that as we warm our planet into the future following this scenario, the likelihood of these rainfall events intensifies dramatically. Keep in mind this is a logarithmic scale, so this is almost a factor of seven. So extreme rainfall events uh, in uh, India, uh, following this warming scenario, will intensify by a factor of seven. That's a lot. So infrastructure needs to be updated and so on. And later on, we will look at Korea as well. Okay, so this is something you can uh, do with these, this probabilistic approach. Now, this is uh, <clears throat> just a very quick illustration of a prediction model where we focus on the next five years. In order to forecast the next five years, we need to put in all the existing climate, ocean, and atmosphere into information that we have on our planet right now into this uh, Earth system model. We call this assimilation. And then we run this Earth system model with the best state estimate of current climate into the future, following the certain scenarios. <clears throat> and uh, this map up here doesn't show the temperature. It shows where our model has skill, how good it is. A value of one means is a very good local skill. So you can see immediately that this modeling system has great skill in predicting not only what's happening uh, in one year, but also what's going to happen in the next five years. So this is a new tool which would be extremely relevant um, if you couple it, it with vaccine models, for instance. So you can determine how many vaccines are needed for particular uh, climate uh, uh, sensitive diseases into the future. And it's uh, really uh, developed to, to improve uh, decision-making uh, <coughs> processes. Okay, this is now a very preliminary, unpublished uh, result. So we use um, a, climate, a new climate model right now um, at nine kilometer resolution globally. So the typical IPCC climate model has a resolution of 100 to 200 kilometers. 
So this is nine kilometers, and the runs are still ongoing, and they use uh, our entire computer uh, nonstop. So I will show you what's happening essentially in these model simulations, just to give you a feeling of how much detail we can resolve. You can see the Hawaiian Islands being hit there by some nasty uh, tropical cyclones or hurricanes. So this is a nine kilometer. We are not simulating only the Hawaiian Islands, but we are simulating the entire planet at this resolution. Okay, so now <clears throat> what happens if we increase the CO2 concentration in this model? This shows the temperature change and is massive. <clears throat> so um, following a business as usual scenario, which I hope uh, the ongoing COP will uh, prevent, uh, but if following a business as, you, as usual CO2 emission scenario, this would be the warming on our planet in 70 years from now. And keep in mind, the Korea War ended se about 70 years ago, so it's not a long time that we are looking into the future here. So in this model, uh, we have a very high climate sensitivity. The planet would warm up by more than six degrees, which is enormous. <clears throat> And you can see certain areas will warm up faster than other areas. And we can just zoom into some of these areas. Um, you can see the Hindu Kush area will warm up by up to 10 degrees. This is massive. Um, and we can uh, see, for instance, the area in South Africa, Namibia, Botswana, will also warm up by up to 10 degrees in this situation. Global mean around six, five to six, but regionally we can have a very large intensification. And this is also important for uh, assessing uh, infectious diseases and climate sensitive uh, diseases. The, we should not look at the global mean temperature. We should look at regional aspects uh, when we make decisions or develop these application models. For Korea, I'm sorry, uh, the Gangwon door was moved in PowerPoint. Now it's somewhere in North Korea. It should, of course, be here. Uh, so you can see even Jiri Sun in Jeju uh, sticking out there as warming hotspots. Why? Because uh, the higher you go into the atmosphere, the more warming there will be. So this is an important effect which affects snow cover in the Himalayas and so on. Okay, so <clears throat> the, of course you have heard about the Arctic warming. This is a hot spot for global warming. The Arctic uh, will warm up here, the Eastern Siberian Arctic will warm up by up to 18 degrees Celsius in this model simulation. So you can see it's much more, it's a factor three more than the global mean. So we have these regional patterns that need to be included in these projections. And again, all of this is very preliminary, but I wanted to give you a, a, a peak view into uh, what's going on. Um, then let's <coughs> uh, talk about other types of ecosystem models. So we recently developed um, a model that simulates 2,000 mammal species on our planet and their interactions. It's the first of its kind. We are testing it right now in the past, so the last 300,000 years, so in order to really understand how it works. And it works quite well. What you just saw was some, some variability here in these uh, um, uh, species, and you wonder why are there lions in Europe? Uh, actually, there were lions in Europe in the past uh, period, so not anymore. And um, so we're testing the model in the uh, past. It's working extremely well, so we will run it all so for future climate scenarios. And that could be interesting. Uh, combined with land use change to assess the risk uh, of climate change, land use change driving zoonotic uh, tensions. And, uh, <clears throat> okay, uh, I wanted to also briefly report <clears throat> uh, some work that we're doing in our center on epidemiological malaria modeling. And again, I'm not an expert <laughs> on this, so I will uh, just go through it very quickly. If, ah, here we go. Oops. <clears throat> So <clears throat> we are using these climate models, and I mentioned we run a climate model 100 times, so we have at every point on our planet, we have 100 realizations of the climate system into the future, giving us a probability distribution. So this is essentially uh, the temperature, uh, how it changes uh, into the future, current temperature, and here are the changes. This is the precipitation and how it will change, and this information from the climate model is put into a uh, malaria model called Vectory, which was developed at ICTP by Adrian Tompkins, and it calculates essentially the uh, malaria transmission as a function of climate variability and also uh, population. 
and it's a, a real dynamical uh, vector density model, uh, and it calculates also infectious bite rates, transmission rates, and we develop projections for the years uh, into the future, 2050 and 2100. And here are the results. So this is the entomological inoculation rate um, <coughs> for present day conditions and for Africa, focusing on Africa. And you can see this is mostly uh, sub-Saharan and Southern Africa where you see very high uh, rates. Then as we go into the future, we put the temperature precipitation data into this uh, vector uh, model. We can see how the uh, EAR uh, will change, and you can see that essentially going from present-day conditions into the year 2090, 2100, there is an intensification by a factor of six. So the maximum value that you usually have in this area south in uh, southern Africa uh, in April goes from a value 0 0.6 to 4. So this is a, a huge increase in the uh, risk uh, of uh, malaria infections due to climate change. So we are planning to do this also for other areas in the future, and one of them is, of course, uh, Korean Peninsula. <coughs> and as you have probably all heard, um, there are outbreaks of uh, malaria uh, in the DMZ. Uh, that was described by Huang in 2016. Uh, these are the 2023 dates unf uh, uh, data. Unfortunately, I didn't get the, the data subsequently. And you can see uh, there was a major spike, actually, in 2023. And of course, 2023 was a particularly warm year. So these are things that we can now uh, use these very high, cli high resolution climate models for run malaria models, uh, as, as the one that I showed earlier on, in order to further assess future uh, risk of infectious diseases and here uh, malaria um, in, for the Korean Peninsula. And uh, the nine kilometer model simulation that I demonstrated earlier on would be a really, really uh, useful tool because it has the regional resolution uh, to make predictions uh, that are relevant for, for these areas. Okay, so <clears throat> let me just say a few words on climate niche modeling for vector-borne diseases. It's very difficult to simulate uh, diseases and uh, so I'm uh, again, uh, just pointing out a few possibilities. One approach is, of course, biogeographic uh, modeling. And I focus here just on Aedes albopictus and Aedes aegypti. Um, and, of course, they are uh, important <coughs> for transmitting Zika, uh, dengue, yellow fever, uh, fever, chikungunya, and so on. And so one approach is actually to use either existing location data and time data for the vectors or for the disease outbreaks, and then look in a climate model what are actually the climatic variables that go along with this and build a statistical, a biogeographical model. It's called a climate envelope model. And then we can feed this climate envelope model with future climate model projections from our center in order to assess the risk of future disease outbreaks. <clears throat> so I wanted to illustrate that here. Um, up at the top, you can see the published um, estimated, um, uh, let's say, habitat of uh, Aedes albopictus. <coughs> and um, so th just we uh, recalculated uh, these uh, um, using existing uh, uh, data, location data of Aedes albopictus, climate model output, we calculated the, the location, the, the habitat. And this is essentially what, what you get, and it looks quite realistic. Now, on top of this, and we haven't done it, we can now add the climate change information from our future climate model uh, projections. So this is one approach. You cannot only do this for the vectors themselves, but you can also say, what about disease outbreaks? So we can take data of disease outbreaks. Here, for instance, um, this was for a dengue a fever and build again one of these biogeographic models and you get essentially risk assessments on a regional scale. Uh, this is very crude. This is the beginning of something that we will develop further into the future and we can use different climate model output uh, data for future predictions of uh, dengue uh, risks. Okay, uh, my last point uh, here is paleo diseases. So I'm very much interested in the early uh, human evolution um, and so there is a very fascinating uh, feature that essentially Neanderthals disappeared from our planet around 38,000 years. 
uh, this is about 4,000 years, maybe 6,000 years after Homo sapiens entered uh, Eurasia. And the question is why? Is it a pure coincidence and so on and so forth? And I've worked on this a little bit trying to assess whether past climate change, abrupt climate change may have been one of the drivers or not. Um, and I came, up, so essentially it is uh, due to competitive exclusion. So Homo sapiens was more competitive in some way uh, but what makes this competitive advantage? And uh, one possible idea is actually that uh, Homo sapiens <coughs> uh, acquired hepatitis B and C and also varicella zoster um, around 200,000 years ago. This is pretty much in the early stages of Homo sapiens, our anatomically modern Homo sapiens group. And they acquired this, uh, developed over about 150,000 years some immunity then <clears throat> they came into uh, Europe around 45,000 years ago. Neanderthals have never seen, uh, for instance, uh, chickenpox. So uh, there is a possibility that chickenpox may have been also one of the drivers of, of the uh, extinction of Neanderthals. Why am I saying this is because chickenpox is w very well known in colonial times to be a very important uh, contributor to uh, a population decline of indigenous populations. Okay, uh, I will skip this part. There are fascinating questions about paleo diseases, and I wanted to point out the last aspect. Of course, we are all talking about extreme events, and uh, if you go to the <coughs> Korean media, uh, if there is a, a Changma season or if there is heat wave season, there is, we are always looking at the extremes. And so there are many ways of changing the extremes. One is just a change in the mean value, and you can see the extreme values get more important. You can increase the width of the distribution, and so on and so forth. There are many different ways, and we need to properly um, quantify uh, these uh, extreme changes in, into the future. This is not easy because it requires the statistics of very rare events. So we need to run a lot of simulations in order to capture this. For this, we need also even faster supercomputers. Now, what we did is we focused here on outdoor labor conditions and what is known as the wet bulb uh, temperature, wet bulb globe temperature. And it's an indication of temperature and relative humidity posing stress on your body when you work outside. So, <clears throat> temperature alone is not the driver for heat exhaustion, of course it contributes, but also high relative humidity uh, is really important because high relative humidity uh, means that you're, you can't sweat <clears throat> as much and your body can't regulate the temperature. So everything high temperature, high relative humidity uh, gets from, let's say, normal working uh, safety to extreme uh, danger in black here. So, <clears throat> we used our climate model um, <clears throat> which was run 100 times into the future in order to see how does this extreme heat stress actually change. And these are projections for the severe heat stress uh, globally um, for a 4 degree warming or for a 1 degree warming. 1 degree warming relative to pre-industrial we have already passed. We are currently at 1.2. So you can see already lots of areas uh, in particular uh, Pakistan and, and so on, they are already in a zone where you have a lot of severe heat stress events, and we know that. But if we go into the future, the global map will start to get much redder and redder. And for instance, for Pakistan, what we can see is these are uh, the period days, uh, person days uh, per year. Um, this is times 10 to the 10. So this is 15 billion person days per year that in the year uh, for a, a four degree warming and so on, uh, will be taken out of Pakistan's labor because it will be unsafe and impossible to work outside. And in fact, we had to introduce a new category because the existing categories of labor safety were already exceeded in the black one. We introduced this extreme danger. Uh, this is a new category that illustrates it's almost impossible to work outside. So this affects agriculture, construction, and so on and so forth. So these are projections, and I think this is also relevant. It's not about infectious diseases, but it's about uh, physical health and physical hazards, and that's something that we can also contribute to with these climate models. Last, I wanted to show, of course, another important factor, and this is how does flooding change in future? <clears throat> 
And what we did here in this map is we, again, used this 100 model simulations in order to determine how does a one in 10 year event change in future. So currently, if we looked at this map for present day conditions, it would be one, one in 10 years. Now, it turns out that over Korea, a current one in 10 year event, rainfall event, becomes three times more often, frequent. However, over the Himalayas, <coughs> In, this, uh, in Southeast Asia, there is a fa factor of 15 intensification. So this is also happening in areas where we have major rivers uh, flooding, uh, flowing out, so dr uh, driving essentially all of this water, intensified uh, water extremes into, into other areas. So this is something to consider. It is something to consider also for infectious disease spreading, vector-borne diseases, but in particular something also for um, infrastructure and uh, uh, planning and uh, hazard mitigation. So this is something uh, to really consider. We have now explicit data on flooding risks, heat risk, and so on and so forth that could be used for future uh, assessments of um, disease and, and health conditions. So with this, I would like to thank you for your attention. And if you are interested in using our data, uh, just scan this code and you will end up on the climate data server that we generated and we can help you from there. Thank you. Thank, oh, you, thank like you very to... much. So thank you very much for that uh, presentation, Mr. Timmerman, and uh, it especially gave us a great understanding of how these uh, models uh, can look into the future to not only prevent the worst in climate change, but of course uh, to predict what kind of medical preventions like vaccines are needed. So thank you once more. Let's give them another big round of applause. Axel, that's a very, very helpful uh, presentation of uh, capabilities in Korea, looking at modeling. Uh, and I think the clear point you made about uh, multidisciplinarity of how we work to plan for the future is extremely important. National health adaptation plans can use a lot of the data that you've put together to plan for best and worst case scenarios. And I think looking particularly at the regionalized view from the data you've collected would be a very important asset for now and, and the future. Just wanted to check, we've got a few minutes if there's any question or clarification from the audience before we move to the next speaker. Yeah, there we go, Saj. Thank you very much, Dr. Axel, for your very nice presentation, very useful. I have one question, because in, in Southeast Asia and even Africa, we are really on, under the climate variability and the monsoon. Uh, what about the prediction about the anomalies in the climate variability, so the El Nino, La Nina? What's going on in terms of, uh, of, of, of simulation and predictions? Uh, El Nino, La Nina, this is a question that I addressed in my PhD thesis in 1999, <laughs> how it will change into the future. So uh, what, it hap what happens in terms of temperature fluctuations in the Eastern Pacific is still unknown. Some climate models predict stronger variability, others predict a weakening. It also depends a little bit on the type of scenario. However, what is robust is that the rainfall changes associated with El Nino and La Nina will intensify. So if we are interested in the impact, it's very clear El Nino and La Nina, whatever is going to happen to their amplitude, will come along with much larger rainfall anomalies in terms of drought or rainfall. Uh, then uh, for the monsoon systems, in general, you can say there is much more water vapor in the atmosphere in future because a warmer atmosphere can hold more moisture. So when you have convergence, which you have when there is uh, air, air convergence, which is what you have when there is monsoon, then most likely you're also going to have stronger rain out and also stronger extreme events. But there are also shifts, and all of this is simulated, so I can show you the detailed maps for, for the area you're from Thai, uh, working in Thailand, I suppose. So we have all of this available. Fantastic. Uh, we'll take one last one. Uh, hello. Um, I saw in your presentation uh, that, um, in fact, the regions with the highest mountains 
are going to have the most uh, severe uh, change in, I mean, uh, rising temperature, as well, you have the most uh, precipitation. So, uh, is there a bias in the models, or uh, is it uh, just a seasonal view of these uh, discrepancies? And are there means to uh, kind of intervene? Yeah. So, <coughs> it is very well known that the global warming increases with altitude all the way up to a level of essentially t uh, 15 to 20 kilometers. So that's a big issue for the Himalayas. Uh, you can say, okay, there are all these glaciers there, but also it means there will be um, changes in the, uh, in the melting. Uh, you have earlier melting of uh, precipitation and so on, uh, snowfall. Uh, so this is a, a very well-known uh, effect. It's not a bias in the models. When we then look at increased precipitation, uh, this is also because in the mountain areas, we, you have a lot of convergence, air flows up, so it releases itself from the water it holds. And in a warmer atmosphere, you have more water vapor that can come out. So, uh, of course, models have biases in general, but these two factors are very robust. Okay, thank you very much. And we'll go to the next speaker, if you would. Okay, why don't we give another a big round of applause for that presentation and also thoroughly answering our questions.